All right, take your bulletin that you were issued during announcements and slide that in there in Daniel chapter number 7. We're going to be coming back to there. I want you to flip over to Revelation chapter number 13. We're going to be continuing our Bible study and series on end times Bible prophecy this evening. And the title of the sermon this evening is The Four Beasts of Daniel. The Four Beasts of of Daniel. Now, tonight is probably going to be a short sermon. It's probably going to be somewhat of a simple sermon as far as how much information is given. This morning, it was, it was, it was pretty heavy, so tonight is going to be a little bit lighter. I'm going to be going into Bible prophecy, and I want to you know, identify what the four beasts are. I want to identify what these four beasts are, and who they are, and what kingdoms they are. Now, ultimately, the reason why we're doing such is because we want to identify the beast of Revelation 13. And one thing that people really truly misunderstand is the time period in which Daniel chapter number 7 is speaking of. Now when we get here in Revelation chapter number 13, I want to read these first couple of verses here just to get an idea of what's going on. It says in verse number 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now I want you to notice there that it mentions that this particular beast looks like a leopard. It looks like he has the feet of a bear, so he looks like a bear in ways. And it also mentions a, a, a lion, and then it speaks about specifically a dragon. Now, those that are familiar, and I'm not going to dive into this too much in Revelation 13 for sake of time, but those that are familiar with Revelation 13, that beast represents two things. That beast represents the Antichrist, but that beast also represents the kingdom. So that beast represents... And the beast is the king who will be the Antichrist that will rule over the whole world in the new world order. But then it also represents the kingdom at the same time in this symbolism that will be reigning over the whole world. And this is very common. I want you to go back to Daniel chapter number 7. Our goal is to identify that kingdom. Our goal is to become as familiar with the beast and who the beast is, what the beast look like, looks like, the characteristics of the beast, so that we can identify that beast when he's on this earth. When these events begin to unfold, when these events begin to take place, and this kingdom is actually coming about and, and is conceived, we want to be able to peg it. We want to be able to see it. This information is in here to be able to tell you what it looks like, so that you can identify this kingdom and you can identify this man. Now in Daniel chapter number 7, we have a few uh, uh, different beasts that are talked about. Four in particular that are very similar unto the beasts in Revelation chapter number 13. And what I'm mostly going to be dealing with tonight, the reason why the sermon is not going to take very long, is I just want to unbrainwash you. I want to unbrainwash you about what most people commonly believe and teach and think about these four beasts. Now, what most people believe about these four beasts is they correctly identify that they are four kingdoms. And we're going to look at that in the chapter. It tells you that they are four kingdoms. It also tells you that they are kings, just like in Revelation 13. The beast is the king. He's the man. But he's also the kingdom. This is very common in analogies and symbolism. So these four beasts, they represent the kings or the conqueror. Because he's the one normally when you think of the kingdom, I mean, who created it? When you think of Persia, you think of Alexander the Great. When you think of Babylon, you think of Nebuchadnezzar. Because there's normally you know, some sort of conqueror behind it, right? That, that brought this empire about. Well, here we have four beasts. And the way in which the majority of Baptists and Bible believers interpret these four beasts is that these beasts happen in secession, one after the next. And we're going to look at this right now, and they believe that the first beast is Nebuchadnezzar. And I am going to show to you and prove to you very clearly in a few different ways that it is 100% not Nebuchadnezzar. It is not Nebuchadnezzar, but rather these beasts are contemporary beasts and they are contemporary kingdoms that will be upon the earth in the end times. Now first I want you to look here in Daniel chapter number 7 at verse number 17. And I'm going to show you that these beasts are kings. Look at verse number 17. It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So I want you to notice that what are they? 
the four kings. Skip down with me to verse number, uh, skip down to verse number 23. It says this, thus he said, the fourth beast, watch this, shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So notice that he just told you that those four beasts were what? They were kings. But then also, what else did he just tell you? He told you that that fourth beast was what? It was a specific kingdom. It's the same thing we see in Revelation 13. It's speaking about the kingdom that will be reigning over the whole earth, but it's also speaking about the beast as in the man. And that's what we see here as well in Daniel chapter number 7. We are looking at and studying about four kingdoms. But each one of these kingdoms also have a man that identifies that kingdom as a conqueror, as a leader, as the king of that particular kingdom. Now I want to uh, get started here. We're going to basically move our way through verse by verse Daniel chapter number 7 this evening. And I want to start in verse number 1. So notice there it says in verse number 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. So this is while he is asleep, the Lord is giving him visions. This is how uh, uh, prophets would receive prophecy and visions. Uh, uh, Oftentimes they were asleep. That's mentioned a few times. Then it says this. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So that is what we're about to read about. Sum is like a, a conclusion. It's going to be an overview is what we're going to see here. Verse number 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So I want you to notice that here, the, the picture that it's painting is Daniel is standing by the sea, on the seashore I would assume, because he's planted there and standing there. He looks out and it says that the four winds of the heaven strove upon the sea. So they're beating upon the sea, it's causing the sea to be tempestuous. It's, it's, it, what it is, it's, it's stirring up a storm within the sea. And then during that, that represents obviously violence, it represents you know, uh, aggression, it represents chaos. Then it says, during that time, four great beasts came up from the sea, and then it says, diverse one from another. So there's four different beasts that arise, that come up out of the sea, and it says that they are diverse one from another. So what's the point there? It's to say that they are four distinct beasts different beasts. You know what that is? That means that there are four distinct different kingdoms or four distinct different kings. Now, does it seem as if one comes up and then the next? Or roughly or generally all four of them come up at the same time? Does it seem like it's secession or just all four arise all at the same time? The picture that's being painted is that all four of these beasts which represent kingdoms, they all somewhat arise out of the sea at the exact same time. Well, in Revelation chapter number 13, we see something very similar as well. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to flip there myself and I'll read it to you. Revelation 13 begins the same way. Now, if someone thinks that they're just going to pick up the book of Revelation and just study Revelation 13, and they're going to be able to look at the world and identify what the kingdom is going to look like in the end times, they're not going to be able to do that. That's not how the Bible is designed. You know, we're commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We are commanded to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. The New Testament is based upon the foundation of the Old Testament. The Bible tells you that. The New Testament is constantly quoting the Old Testament. The prophecies that John were given were tied into and were just adding to and supplementing what Daniel was given in the book of Daniel. I want to show you the consistency and the parallel with what the vision that John gets. Revelation 13.1 says this, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Sound familiar? And so saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And then he goes on to describe what this specific beast looks like. Now, I no notice that when John received his revelation, it's almost exactly like Daniel's. You need the book of Daniel and you need the book of Revelation in order to understand what is going to take place in the end times. It's just like in oftentimes things you're studying in the Gospels. You can't just study one Gospel all along and you're, they're going to be missing pieces of the puzzle. God gave us the whole Bible and God wants you to put work in and not to be lazy. You know, you need to be a workman that's found approved unto God. You need to study your Bible. You need to, you know, search things, look up words, compare scriptures, find parallel passages. That's what God expects from us. So right here in Daniel, we see it's a parallel with Revelation 13. He sees four beasts rise up out of the sea just like John sees a beast rise up out of the sea. When he sees these four beasts come up out of the sea, they all come up 
at the same time. I want to point that out to you. Now that's very important. I want, you, I want to keep looking here, verse number 4. It says this, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And then verse 5, he goes on, and, and behold another beast. Now first I want to look at this first beast very quickly, because this right here is why a lot of people think that it's Nebuchadnezzar. They try to make some connections here between the wings and also between the, the heart. Uh, uh, you know, it says he beheld, he says, uh, he, says uh, uh, be, he beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it says, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. A lot of people say, hey, that's describing what took place with Nebuchadnezzar. That sounds exactly like what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. No, it doesn't. Because when you look at it very, very closely, it's actually teaching the exact opposite. It's teaching the opposite of what took place with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, with Nebuchadnezzar, what happened was he lost his kingdom. And when he lost his kingdom, that's when he grew, you know, his hair came out like feathers, he grew talons. So when he was downgraded, that's when he lost his kingdom. I want you to notice that. And that's when he began to look like a bird. And what took place then? He, and obviously he's not literally looking like a bird. He's just out of control. He's, you know, his nails are long. He's got the heart of a beast, right? So notice that he's given a heart of a beast when he's downgraded, right? Now, furthermore, when all of that took place, it says that he was given a heart of a beast. Now, look at what it says here. It says, I beheld, so this is a lion that had eagle's wings, till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, watch this, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and then it says, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, for an animal, for a bird like an eagle, you know, how important it, you know, is it for them to have wings? How important is it? Seems like a silly question, but how important is that? It's critical. I mean, they're useless at that point, right? That is what, you know, that, you know, that is what, you know, gives them their power, if you will, right? That's what gives them their strength. That's where their strength lies, right? It's within their wings. If you were to pluck their wings, it sounds like an upgrade or a downgrade. It sounds like a major downgrade, right? Not only that, it says that it had a, 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 a it was like a lion. Now, I want you to notice that it says, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And it says this, and a man's heart was given to it. So what does that imply about what type of heart did it have before? Like the, the heart of a lion, right? Well, I want you to turn with me to, to 2 Samuel chapter number 17. Keep your hand there. And I'm going to prove to you that this is speaking about a downgrade. And that this is actually something bad that happened to this kingdom. It's speaking about this kingdom being conquered is what it's speaking about. 2 Samuel chapter number 17. Look at verse number 10. It says, And he also that is valiant, watch this, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. For all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant men. So notice that when they have the heart of a lion, they're valiant, they're brave, they're bold, they're strong. But their heart melts. What happens? The heart of the lion is taken away, and it's a bad thing. They've lost their power, they've lost their strength. What's being described here with this beast that's like a lion that has eagle's wings? It's being plucked. It can no longer fly. It's lost an ability. It's been downgraded. It's lost the heart of a beast, of a lion. What does a lion represent in the Bible? It's the king of the animal kingdom. It's the king of the jungle. So what's going on is this, this kingdom has been downgraded is what's taken place. Now, when, as I said, when Nebuchadnezzar, when all of that happened to him, his downgrade was giving him the heart of a beast. It wasn't taking away the heart of a beast or taking away the heart of a lion. It was giving him the heart of a beast. So it's not the same thing at all. When it talks about him looking like an eagle, it's just talking about his fingernails growing out long. I'm going to prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that this is not speaking about Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to look at verse number 1. Verse number 1, we're going to get the time period. It says this, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now let me ask you a question. Who is Belshazzar? It's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. It goes Nebuchadnezzar, evil Merodach, and then Belshazzar. He's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Is Nebuchadnezzar still alive at the time that Daniel has this vision? He's not. I want you to look in Daniel chapter number 7. Look at verse number 17. These great beasts, which are four, 
are four kings, now watch this, which shall arise out of the earth. What tense is that? That's future tense. This is at the time of Belshazzar. Is this possible? Even possible that it could be referring to Nebuchadnezzar? It's not even possible. It's 100% not possible. It, furthermore, you, it just shows you too, when, you, when, when people want to try to make something fit, or maybe when they already have a preconceived idea, they can make connections that are not there. And that's what people have done with this particular passage, and they've overlooked the context to find out what this is actually speaking about. So this is four beasts that shall arise out of the earth. I want, I want to keep reading here. I want to look at beast number two now. Look at verse number five. It says this, And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So right here we have a bear, and it says it's raised up on one side. Maybe that's referring to that uh, uh, it may be a two-sided kingdom, kind of like the, Pe uh, the Persians and the Medes, and maybe one side is a little bit stronger than the other side. That's very common when you have kingdoms that have kind of you know, amalgamated or come together. Uh, and then not only that, it says that it has three ribs in the mouth of it. That's referring to it going out and conquering. That's referring to it going out and, and, and there's destruction there. Now normally, these little things that you may look over, there's a reason why it says three ribs. It's referring to something there. Now, whether or not that's three kingdoms that it's destroyed or whatever it may be, it's probably one kingdom and it's referring to three sections within that kingdom. Because you would assume that these ribs come from the same you know, animal or same beast, right, in the analogy. So it's probably three ribs that come from the same kingdom, which maybe it's three provinces. Maybe it's three nations or kingdoms within a kingdom. Or maybe three kings that were ruling and reigning or leaders that he destroyed. So, that's beast number two. So, number one, we have a lion that has eagle's wings, right? Number two, we have a bear. That was the second beast, a bear. And it says that somebody said unto it, he said, they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. So, this is going to be a fierce beast. It's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Look at verse number six. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now here we have a leper. And notice, I want you to notice that everything thus far is referring to just natural animals that we see just in nature. Just within nature, these are all normal natural animals. Now, there's been a few blends, like they've said, hey, it's, this one has wings. It's a lion that has wing, eagle's wings. The leopard has wings, right? But it's all what has been mentioned thus far is just normal animals that we'll see out in the wild. So here we have a leopard, and it says, which had on the back of it, watch this, four wings of a fowl. So this one is specifically mentioned to have four wings. And not only that, there's something very interesting about this one that's different than the others. It says that it had four wings and also said, the beast had also four heads. So there's something significant about this beast with the number four. Now, when we get to uh, Revelation chapter number 13 and Revelation chapter number 17, we're going to see that that particular beast that's mentioned there has seven heads. And that's going to become important when we start you know, putting all the, the pieces of the puzzle together. When we get there, it talks about those mountains and that those mountain, those that their heads are, represent mountains and those mountains represent kingdoms and those kingdoms also re are represented by a king. So I believe that it's very safe to say, actually I know that it is, and you'll see this later, that the four heads that this is referring to are four kings. And these four heads that this leopard has are four kingdoms and ultimately four kings. This is a nation that has come together. And a lot of nations are formed exactly in this way by making an allegiance with one another. So there's four heads and it says, and dominion was given unto it. Now we're not going to go to Revelation 13, but that's a phrase that's used about the Antichrist and the beast there. It says that dominion was given to it. It says, and, and, and uh, the, the authority and the power that was given to it came from the dragon. That's talking about from the devil. I believe that that's what this is referring to as well. Look at, uh, I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 5. Jeremiah chapter number 5. So it's just back a couple of pages, a few books. Jeremiah chapter number 5. <clears throat> a leopard is a, the type of animal that 
is spoken of as prowling around very often. It, what it does is it lies in wait. When we study leopards in the Bible, that's always how they're characterized. And that's why these analogies are used to point out that these kingdoms have very specific uh, 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 characteristics that are similar unto these animals. They chose these animals out particularly for these different kingdoms because they shared characteristics with them. So I want you to look with me at Jeremiah chapter number 5. Look at verse number 6. It says this, Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evenings shall spoil them. Watch this. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goeth out then shall be torn in pieces. So notice what this leopard's doing. It says it's watching over their sittings. What is it doing? It's lying in wait. It's sitting back and it's stalking its prey is what we would say. I want you to look at chapter 13 verse 23 in the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 13 verse 23. It says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. This is the other characteristic that is mentioned and obvious about a leopard is what? That it has spots. It has spots. Now, the leopard was mentioned also in Revelation 13. I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, when we study bears, which was the second beast there in the Bible, what does it talk about when it speaks about bears in the Bible? What's the most common thing that you see over and over again mentioned about bears in the Bible? Does anybody remember? Talks about, what was it? Devouring? Well, we'll talk about devouring. Yeah, with, you know, it's a fierce animal. But specifically what I'm referring to uh, that's kind of distinct to the bear and not all just kind of fierce animals is that it talks about it being robbed of its whelps. As a bear robbed of its whelps. So I think that that's probably a good characteristic that's, that's distinct to the bear throughout the Bible. When we study bears, we study different characteristics that are mentioned. That's one thing that's brought up repeatedly when it talks about the bear. It talks about it being robbed of... It's whelps. I want you to look, and whelps are just like it's cubs. It's babies, right? I want you to look with me now at verse number 7. It says this, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten Horns. Now, I want you to notice that this animal is very different than the other animals. This animal, number one, you can see is much stronger. It's much more frightful. It's much, you know, uh, it says that it is exceedingly strong. So he says, behold, a fourth beast, he says, dreadful and terrible. So this is not, now, a, a lion, to see a leopard or to see a lion, I mean, that's pretty scary. In person, to stand in front of a lion that's devouring, to see a bear that's walking, and, you know, you know let's picture, you know, it's, it's, it's fierce and it's got ribs in its mouth. That's a pretty frightful sight. I'm not talking about a cartoon. I'm talking about a real bear that just tore something apart and it's got, you know, the remnants of, of what it had just ripped apart. And it, somebody says, devour much flesh. This is not a pretty sight. That's pretty scary, right? That's a pretty fierce sight. But he didn't describe this fourth beast like that. He looks at the fourth beast and the fourth king and he says when he sees this one, in comparison, this one is dreadful and terrible. So this beast is kind of on its own level here. This beast is far more powerful. This beast is far more terrifying. He says dreadful and terrible and then he says this, and strong exceedingly. So it's far stronger than the beasts that were before it is what I take away from that. It says, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. This is not the same explanation that was given of the first three beasts. It says, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was, watch this, diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Notice it says it was diverse. It was very different. So this beast stands out. It's stronger. It's more terrible. The description here, does it sound like a normal, natural animal? Now, the lion with the wing, the eagle's wings is not necessarily a normal, natural animal, but what's being put together of, the, you know, of these different animals, they're all normal animals, aren't they? They're natural animals that we can find out in you know, nature. But this animal, what's being described is, you can't really find anything like this, can you? You can't really, you, there's nothing out there that has, you know, it, it speaks about it having ten horns. I mean, what animal has ten horns like that? What animal is so fierce that... If you compared it to a lion, that it would say, this one is dreadful and terrible. This one has great iron teeth and it devours and breaks 
in pieces. And it says, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. This is obviously a much more powerful beast. So this kingdom is going to be far more powerful than all the other kingdoms that are upon the earth. Uh, verse 8, it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So there was ten, right? And I'm going to go back over this again when I start to explain the interpretations in the next week. The interpretation thereof, right? And uh, there's a little horn that pops up after it. So there's ten horns, and then there's a little horn that comes up after the ten. That makes eleven, right? Then it says, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. That's referring to the Antichrist in Revelation chapter number 13. Now, uh, if we keep reading here in verse number 9, he speaks about judgment day and verse number uh, 10. I want you to look at verse number 11 where this is extremely, it gets, it gets very, very important here in verse 11 and 12. This is what really, so let me, let me say this. You know, I want you to understand how significant this is. Every Baptist, I have, you know, and, and I wouldn't teach something all out on my own, just standing on a limb unless I knew I was 100% right. Brother Rick feels like he knows what I'm about to say. I have never heard anyone explain these beasts in the way that I'm explaining it to you right now. I personally believe, not saying this in an arrogant way at all, but that I have never heard one other person teach this correctly one time. And I can prove very clearly that all four of these beasts are all on the earth at the exact same time. Everyone teaches that they are in secession. Everyone. I've never heard an exception to that. I've watched a lot of videos. I've listened to a lot of preaching. I've listened to a lot of sermons. Everybody says it's Babylon. That's Nebuchadnezzar. That's the lion with the eagle's wings. Then they go to... The, the bear. That's Persian and Medes. It's raised up on one side. It's like the two kingdoms, right? One stronger than the other. That's the Persians and the Medes. Then they go to the leopard and they're like, that's Greece. Because Greece is fast. It comes in real swift. You know, like a leopard. Then they get to this last one. They're like, that's Rome. And then it's the Roman Catholic Church that's, you know, that is uh, 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 reincarnated, you know, and that's basically the dragon of the end times that we read about. That's everybody's interpretation. Virtually every single person. I'm going to show you and, and that all four of these beasts are contemporaries. They're all four on the earth at the exact same time. All four of these kingdoms we're reading about will all be here. And there's you know, a way that this plays out together with all of these nations. And that, we would say nations today, right? These are four nations that... You know, if it's if you know the end times happens in the next 20, 30 years, these are probably nations that exist today on the earth. I'm going to show you that without a shadow of a doubt, not just blowing smoke. Look at verse number 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till watch this, the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now let me ask you a question. What does that sound like? Sounds like the Antichrist. Isn't there almost an exact verse like that in the book of Revelation? Now, I don't want to turn to that right now. But, you know, it talks about in Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 10, it talks about, the, and the beast was taken, and the false prophet that was with him, that deceived them, that dwelled on the face of the earth. And, you know, and then it says, all them that dwelled upon the face of the earth. And then it says at the end, and they were tormented with fire and brimstone, right, forever and ever. So notice that the beast was taken and he was thrown where? Into the lake of fire. Doesn't that sound pretty similar? Now, when we read about that beast, it talks about that little horn popping up. Everybody agrees that's the Antichrist. Everybody across the board because you can't deny it. There's more information later in this chapter, exact quotations later on. So we know this is talking about the Antichrist and the Antichrist kingdom. But I want you to look at verse number 12. This is what gives all these people a major problem. Look at verse number 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts... Now, who's that talking about? It's talking about the other three kingdoms, isn't it? Look at what it says. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Do you notice that? All four of these beasts are on the earth at the exact same time. All four of these beasts are on the earth at the time that the beast, the Antichrist, is taken and his body is given to the flame. His body is given to the fire, isn't it? And then it says that, right then, that the other beast, their dominion is taken away. 
Their dominion is taken away, yet their lives are, pro, are, they are prolonged. They're allowed to live, it says, for a season and a time. Now, what does that tell you? That the beasts are obviously on the earth at the exact same time. So, you know, it, it, this couldn't be any clearer. These four beasts are beasts that are all on the earth at the exact same time. Now, I want, I want to skip ahead at verse number 15 now, and I'm just about finished. I said it's going to be short tonight because there's a few points that I want to hammer in. Don't you think that's pretty important what I just now showed you? I have never heard that talk correctly my entire life. And I mean, I have listened to a lot of end times Bible prophecy on Daniel 7. So many different people teaching it. Never, every single person, everybody teaches that they're one after the next. So what I want you to take away, this is bite size. I want you to take away tonight, I want you to understand these beasts because these beasts are going to tie in with that beast in Revelation 13 in a very big way when we get to you know, that point in the series. So these, all these beasts are all on the earth at the same time. That's why, let me point this out again. Remember I said in the very beginning, does it seem like these beasts arise one after the next when he looks out in the sea? Or does it seem like they all arise at the same time, roughly or generally? Seemed like he looked out there and you know what happened? Four beasts, maybe like this, but four beasts just arose out of the sea, right? That's because they're all contemporaries. They all live at the exact same time. Look at verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by <laughs> and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the thing. So Daniel saw it, and I mean, it's difficult. You know, in times, and all of this, it, it's symbols, and you've got to kind of figure out what it's talking about. So even Daniel had trouble understanding it. Then it's interpreted. Verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, watch this, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Which beast is that referring to? Fourth beast, right? He says he wanted to know the truth of the fourth beast. That's the fourth kingdom. That's the fourth kingdom that's going to be on the earth. That's the, 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 the kingdom or the beast that has the ten horns, right? That's the, the kingdom or the beast where the Antichrist arises out of. And remember, he plucks up three of the, the horns by the roots. And notice that he, he saw all these other beasts. And obviously, they were, you know, they were astounding. They were amazing and powerful. But furthermore, this beast, he's like, hey, tell me about that fourth beast. I want to know. He, he's standing there with the angel and he's like, I want to know about that fourth beast. What is that thing? What's the deal with that fourth beast? Why? Because he's in all of it, right? He looks at it and he's in all of this beast. Why? Because it's exceeding dreadful. He says, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Now, here's another error. This is the other thing that I really want to get through to you tonight. Most people identify this, fir this fourth beast just as on its own, this fourth beast distinct from the other three beasts, as being the beast of Revelation 13. Because they view this in succession, they see that fourth beast and they're like, see that fourth beast? That's the fourth kingdom. And that fourth beast and that fourth kingdom is the Roman Catholic Church because it's the Roman Empire that's been you know, reincarnated, right? This is what everybody teaches. This is what virtually, as I said, everybody teaches. It's in chronological order. They're in succession. And the fourth beast, that's where the Antichrist is. So you can see where they're coming from from that. It makes perfect sense, right? But it's not that simple. If we go to Revelation chapter number 13, and this is what pretty much we're going to end on right here. I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 13. I want you to look at this beast. And verse number 1, something it tells us about this beast. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So I want you to notice when this beast rises up out of the sea, and there's a further description we're going to get to later. It's outside of the scope of this particular sermon. But it has seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. I want you to go back to Daniel chapter number 7. And I'm going to show you that that fourth beast, when he sees this fourth beast alone, it doesn't have seven heads. It has one head. So this beast, has, has it goes through 
a, a, a change, if you will. And I don't want to give too much information about this yet. But this beast or this kingdom, it goes through a change. But right now, the kingdom that we see here before, you know, before, you know, there's a, a, a you know, let's say wars and pestilences and things like that, this individual nation or this individual kingdom, it only has one head. I'll show that to you a couple of ways. Look at verse number 19. Then will I know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful. It says, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Now watch verse 20. And of the ten horns, watch this, that were in his, what? Head. Does it say these ten horns are all in, the, they're, they're, they're scattered throughout the heads? No, they're not. This beast, when it's found in Daniel 7, has one head. This is not the exact beast that is in Revelation 13. And there's a reason why. This is a totally different beast uh, that is independent from the end times kingdom. There is, a, there is a change that takes place. And at this time, this beast has one head. Now, it's very clear in this text, that's enough for us to say it has one head. But not only that, further proof is that, well, how many heads did the leopard have? Four. And what was it very clear to do when it told you about the leopard as opposed to the lion and the bear? What did it tell you? This one has four heads. Did it mention that about the bear and about the, the lion? No. Because it had one head, right? I mean, it's silly, but it's obvious. So it wanted to di differentiate that. When there is this kind of uh, uh, specialty characteristic about it, it says, hey, this one has four heads. But notice here, it doesn't mention anything about multiple heads, but it actually even clarifies. And isn't that interesting you can find that in the text here? That it tells you, it says, and of the ten horns that were in his head. If you look at pictures that people will draw of this, and I've seen many different Renaissance pictures, and I like looking at those old-time pictures. I really enjoy those. If you notice the thumbnails that I pick out and use, I hit those black and white Renaissance all the time, medieval time thumbnails. I love those pictures a lot. I love those pictures that are found in the, you know, the King James Bible, those older pictures. If you look at all the pictures that they drew in the medieval times and the Renaissance era, do you know what they do with the horns every time in Revelation 13? They take the horns and they disperse the horns throughout the seven heads. Here's the beast in Daniel 7 before the change takes place. And I want you to notice where the ten horns are. That's very important. It's upon the one head of that beast, isn't it? When we see the beast in, in Revelation 13, and I'll go ahead and end with this and tell you this, it has ten horns. And there's seven heads there. But let me tell you this. Those horns are not dispersed throughout those heads. Those horns are on one head of that beast. And right here it's very clear that this is referring to in the fourth beast... This is a beast. It's very similar to Revelation 13, and I'll explain you know, what took place by comparing Scripture to Scripture. But this is a very similar beast to the fourth beast, or to the beast in Revelation 13. The fourth beast is similar to that, but it only has one head. It only has one head. Let's keep reading here, and we're going to end. We're going to close with just reading a little bit more Scripture. It says in uh, uh, verse number 20, it further goes on to speak of the Antichrist. It says, And of the ten horns that were in his head, and, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout <clears throat> than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possess the kingdom. And I've pointed this out before, but it's perfect while we're reading through it. Notice who comes. Who's it say comes? The Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days in that passage? The Father, it sounds like. Huh? Who's sitting there and judging? The Father. Isn't that interesting? The Ancient of Days came. What did the Ancient of Days look like? It looked like Jesus. We look at the description of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Looks like he's the Ancient of Days. We go back to Daniel and it talks about when the sun is going to come back and it says, the Ancient of Days came. Do you know who it's saying is coming back? The Everlast As Brother Hall prayed in his prayer earlier, the Everlasting Father. That's who's coming back. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it says, And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, 
And watch this, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom, notice that, where are they at? Those ten horns are in one kingdom. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand into a time, until a time and times, and dividing of time. That's three and a half years. That's referring to the tribulation. There's no doubt that this is referring to the Antichrist. That fourth kingdom is for sure... That is the kingdom that the Antichrist comes out of. Now, this is extremely important. And we can. Now, you know, I, I, I'm very against a lot of times people trying to interpret who these beasts are. And the reason why is because they don't start here. They start in current news. They start using the media. They start, their, their authority doesn't come from here. Their authority is news, you know, uh, current events, and things like that. But these, uh, these things that are written in here, all these characteristics, the, the characteristics of each beast and of each kingdom, they're there so that you can look around and see what this looks like. They're there so that you can identify these kingdoms and you can see what's happening. So it's very important that we make sure that we, that we study this deeply and we, you know, we don't overlook things that may seem like that's not important. Well, that's not important. You know, even though it's like 3,000 years off with Nebuchadnezzar when that kingdom is taking place in this time, literally 3,000 years. That's not important. That's not that important. That first beast is going to be on this earth while you're alive if it happens in your lifetime. As opposed to interpreting as Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, good grief. When it happens in Belshazzar's time, shall arise out of the earth. That's big. And that's going to play into understanding Revelation chapter number 13. You can't understand the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel. Keep that in mind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for everyone that's here tonight. We ask you that you would bless us and give us an understanding of your word just as that angel interpreted your word uh, uh, and your vision unto Daniel. We ask you that you would guide us with the Holy Spirit as we study it and you, that we would be diligent, dear God, and, and uh, be a, a workman that is pleasing in your sight and not to be ashamed. We ask you that you would bless the rest of the night, bless the food, bless the fellowship, dear God. Uh, thank you that my family's here. I ask you that you would uh, keep them safe and in their travels. And I also ask you that you would just bless each and every family that is here tonight. We love you so much and just be with us. And in Jesus' name.